EKG of the week. Let's look at another real life EKG, walk through it, get some practice on it. So as always, take a second, pause the video, look at this EKG, and come back when you are uh, when you got a determination. All right, hopefully that's given you enough time. Let's run through the interpretation of this thing. So we'll start with rate. Rate will count the QRS complexes across the bottom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, multiply by six, and we end up with a rate of 48. So a little bit bradycardic. How about rhythm? We got to find some P waves here. We got to look for some P waves and see where they're most apparent. It looks like there is, uh, that, that could be a P wave there. It's uh, not entirely clear. Um, that might be a P wave there. It's right on the edge of the uh, line though. That looks like a P wave and that looks like a P wave. So if we kind of track that down here, that's what P waves look like in lead two. And yeah, P wave, P wave, P wave. So it looks like there is a, a P wave before each QRS and a QRS following each P wave with the exception of this guy right here where it is hard to tell. Maybe there's a PAC kind of buried back in this mess here. But it looks like this is probably a sinus rhythm. So rate, rhythm, axis. Let's look at axis real quick. Uh, lead one in this case is negative. Lead two is mostly negative. The QRS is below the baseline for the most part. And in AVF, it is mostly above the baseline, so positive. So down in one, down in two, up in AVF. When we look at a chart, down in one is over on this side. Here's lead one, so we're on the negative side of it. Down in lead two, this is the negative part of lead two right here. So we already know we have to be over here someplace, and then we have to be over here someplace. And already we've kind of seen that it's got to be sort of someplace in this area, so it's going to be a weird axis to start with. When we add AVF, remember we were positive in AVF, so uh, let's see. Down in one, got to be over here somewhere. Down in two, got to be over here somewhere. And then the down, or positive and AVF puts you down here someplace, which essentially means over here, but ends up in the uh, area of right axis. All right, so we've got a rate of 48. We have a sinus rhythm, a sinus bradycardia, and we have right axis deviation. How about uh, intervals and blocks? Let's look at our intervals. If we again go back to our P waves here, is the start of the P wave to the start of the QRS complex less than one big box? P wave starts kind of right on the line there. QRS starts right before the line. So yes, that looks like smaller than one big box and we can confirm that on another uh, beat and on another beat. So it looks like a normal-ish PR interval. Uh, how about the QRS interval? Here, and the easiest place to see this is lead one up here, it looks like. So we see a sort of rabbit ear morphology uh, that we know looks like a right bundle branch block, but is it wide? Let's see, again, less or uh, normal would be less than three little boxes. In this case, we see uh, there's a little box, two little boxes, three little boxes. The QRS is still going. So this is a wide complex, and it looks like it's got a right bundle branch block morphology to it. So this is a what appears to be a right bundle, uh, which accounts for the wide QRS. And then uh, I always, again, lump the uh, QT interval in with my intervals uh, assessment. The T wave looks like it ends right there. Again, grossly, we could get the computer to do it, but does the T wave finish up before the diff... Uh, before you get halfway between the R, R waves there. And it looks like it does. You know, the T wave kind of finishes here. The midway point between these beats looks like it's somewhere around here. So this looks like a grossly normal QT interval. Again, you can put numbers on it, but from my eye, that looks pretty normal to me. So we again have a wide complex QRS. We've got normal intervals otherwise, and what looks like a right bundle branch block morphology. Rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, blocks. How about ischemia and infarct? Let's scan through here and look at the vascular territory. So I always just, because it's here, go left to right, start with the um, lateral leads. And it's tough to tell. The, the QRS is kind of at the peak of a line here, and it's, it's not really clear if this is really up or down. It's hard to say, and this one's on the beat. That's unfortunate. It would be nice to get another EKG. How about an AVL, the other lateral lead here? 
Uh, <clears throat> in that case, we see maybe just a little bit of ST depression, perhaps. But again, tough to tell. Wandery, a little bit wandery baseline. The complexes don't quite line up, but maybe a little ST depression. How about in the inferior leads here? This one, again, it's at the top of a hill, so it's really hard to tell. We could go down and look at it on the rhythm strip and see if it lines up a little better down here. And again, this is the same thing. This is lead two. It's just a longer strip of it. Now there we see the baseline looks to be kind of right in the center of the magnifying glass right there. But when we move on over to the ST segment, it looks like that is elevated. And it looks like that's elevated by maybe a millimeter, one little box, maybe just under. Uh, but kind of concerning. Again, a little bit hard to say in most of these because the baseline is a little bit, a little bit janky and tough to tell. Same concern here in lead three. Uh, there might be a little bit of ST elevation depending on where you look like there to there doesn't really look like it, but there to there looks like it might be tough to say. Uh, AVF also in the vascular territory, there does look to be a little bit of elevation, but it's hard to say that it's a millimeter, at least based on that tracing. So some concerning inferior, possibly elevation, but it's a little bit difficult to uh, call it based on that. How about uh, when we get to the precordials here, let's scan down. Uh, pretty normal-ish looking. Whoa, that's down there quite a bit. And this is kind of a funky looking ST segment too. Uh, it's flat, it's really broad, and it's fairly depressed below the baseline here. We see the same thing here. We actually see the same thing here and here and here. So ST depression we usually think of as being ischemia, but when it happens in V2 and V3, and when it specifically looks like that, when it is flat and broad, um, you get concerned because that's the look of a posterior STEMI. A posterior meaning it's affecting the backside of the heart. And you may say, well, STEMI means, you know, ST elevation. That's true, except that these leads are looking through the front of the heart themselves. And whatever happens on the back is going to be the opposite on an EKG. So if these, if ST elevation would happen in the front, then ST depression happens when it's going through the back. So uh, that morphology is, uh, is concerning that this might be a posterior STEMI. Uh, in fact, what we can do is take the EKG, flip it over and look through the back of it, and then analyze V2 and V3. And in that case, we see that that looks convincingly, fairly convincingly like uh, ST elevation uh, morphology like a STEMI itself. Uh, hopefully you would uh, you would agree with my assessment there that that looks like the old classic STEMI that we see. And again, what we've done here is just flip the EKG over and we're looking through the back of it, uh, looking at V2 and V3 and NV1 to some extent. You can also get posterior leads. Um, and the way you would do that is when you don't stop at lead V6, you keep wrapping around the back for V7, V8, V9. Uh, and put those there. And, and if you get a millimeter of ST elevation in those, it can be more subtle. But if you get a millimeter of ST elevation, that's concerning for posterior STEMI. So in this case, I am concerned this might be a posterior MI. Um, the other thing that kind of goes along with that is that we have some elevation maybe over here in lead three and lead two and AVF, most convincingly probably in lead two and three. So that would potentially be concerning as well because the right side of the uh, vascular system often perfuses a lot of the back side of the heart. So this might be a uh, postero inferior or an infero posterior uh, STEMI. That would be the concern anyway. The uh, patterns that we see, and again, I bring up just this a uh, wide, broad ST depression here. The things that would make you concerned for this versus other forms of ST depression in the precordial leads. If it has a dominant R wave, it, meaning if there's this big, tall R wave to start off with in lead V2, that doesn't normally happen. Um, <clears throat> and it might be uh, concerning for posterior STEMI. A upright T wave here would be is part of the uh, criteria for it. And then that broad, uh, flat ST depression is concerning for posterior STEMI. So all these are working together. And in fact, this person uh, presented with a ventricular rhythm uh, that got uh, shocked and then had this rhythm with it. And one of the more common reasons for uh, ventricular rhythm, ventricular tachycardia, if you don't have it before, is uh, in fact ischemia and infarct. So this looks, the clinical picture and the EKG looks concerning for a posterior uh, MI. 
And uh, this is somebody that I would approach aggressively, bypass, you know, go to, go to a cath lab, give aspirin, put pads on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So our impression, and this is a sinus bradycardia with a right bundle branch block, not clear if that's new or old, and uh, inferior posterior uh, STEMI. With that, uh, we will catch you on the next time, and uh, stay safe out there. We'll see you next time.